I haven't done one of these videos in a while, so today we're going to watch the incredible creatures of Celtic mythology and folklore. Yes, I. I mean, I'm really interested in folklore and stuff like that. That's all part of history, right? And these stories that are told and all these creatures that are told about in uh, in in mythology is uh, how should I put it? Uh, conducive to the medieval times or the times that they're in to, to share as warnings or you know things like that so you know let's go ahead and watch this vibe you're welcome to mr giant reacts and ting and ting and ting i'm mr giant and i ain't going to keep us too long here let's go ahead on youtube by simmer simmer and check out these myths Celtic mythology is one of the most diverse in the world whose stories refer to several creatures some are kind and peaceful, others are hideous and cruel monsters. The Leprechaun is one of the best known figures in Celtic mythology, and is well known in Irish folklore. Usually represented as a small man, with a size between 30 and 50 centimeters, the Leprechaun is part of the family of elves and gnomes. He lives in the bushes, or in small burrows, made in the tree trunks of the forest, where he spends his days working on a single shoe. As the shoemaker in charge of making the shoes for the fairy people, the leprechaun makes only one pair of shoes a year, as these are magical and extremely rare items. The leprechaun is also known to be the guardian of valuable treasures, such as pots full of gold coins. For this reason, he usually avoids humans, who, driven by greed, always try to capture the leprechaun to steal the precious metal. Although they are almost always associated with forests and woods, some creatures from Celtic mythology also inhabit the seas. Selkies are humanoid beings that live in the sea, but differ from the traditional versions of mermaids found in other cultures. Selkies can assume the form of seals and return to their human appearance whenever they wish. To change shape, a selkie only needs to swim to shore. When she reaches dry land, she removes her seal skin, becoming a beautiful young woman. When she returns to the sea, Selkie puts her seal skin back on and dives into the water. There are also male Selkies, described as very handsome in human form. They seek out human females who are dissatisfied with their love life. If a woman wants to establish contact with a male Selkie, she must go to a beach and even shed seven tears into the sea. The origin of Selkies is mysterious. Some people believe that they were once human beings, but, victims of some curse, they were condemned to live like animals until the end of their days. Others believe that Selkies are souls of those who have drowned and are trapped between the material and spiritual worlds. When we think of fairies, we you... You know, that's crazy, man, you know, because a lot of these uh, myths are so similar. I mean, this one had to do with the water, the ocean, or the rivers, or something like that. But then we have, back on the island, we have the, uh, the La Jobless, who in my, on my island, the understanding of it is, uh, is a woman who died as a virgin, but comes back and kidnaps men. But she comes back as a beautiful woman. The only curse that she had on herself is she had one hoofed leg and one human leg. And she would kidnap young men and take them away. They never, most of them are never heard from again, but they are, <laughs> and if they do come back, they're what we call Bazodi, you know, they, they, they're not in the right mind, you know. So that's the land, kind of a land version of that there, you know what I mean? Now, in all the versions, it's always a woman who is beautiful or a man who is handsome, you know, it's that beware of those, uh, those, uh, those what we call saga boys. <laughs> Or pretty girls, you know, they're gonna lead you down the right, wrong path. You know what I mean? You gotta be aware of them. Let's keep going. Usually, imagine kind and cheerful creatures that flutter and dance among the trees and flowers. But there are also dark fairies who will do anything to harm humans. A good example of an evil fairy is the Lenin Sida, also known as the fairy lover in Irish folklore. Lenin is portrayed as an exceptionally beautiful woman who lives near the tombs in cemeteries and is always looking for male lovers, especially widowers who visit the graves of their deceased wives. Legend has it that when a man becomes the lover of a Leonin, he shortens his life, but is filled with pleasures and joys. 
An old legend says that there was once an artist that had no inspiration to create his songs. Then, a Leonin appeared before him, in exchange for his love, gave him the inspiration he needed to continue his work. The artist accepted the proposal, and spent his days totally in love with the Leonin, composing the most beautiful songs ever written, and making a lot of money. But as days passed, madness took over his mind, and he died alone, wandering among the hills of Ireland. Another example of evil fairies are the fearsome banshees, whose cries are so loud and terrifying that they can take a person's life. Banshees live in the dark regions of forests, and are often found in graveyards, where they wander among the graves, shedding tears of grief and resentment. The cry of the banshees is a harbinger of death, announcing that the end of a life is near, either the person who heard the cry, or a close relative. The legend of the Banshees come from an ancient Celtic custom, where some women were hired to mourn wistfully the death of some important member of the nobility. Banshees can arise both physically and spiritually. Their death scream can be heard from miles away, making it impossible to escape the clutches of death. Although they are also... Now there is one back home called Mama Melody. And it's a woman who, I don't know, I guess she died in childbirth. If my memory served me right, if anybody from the Caribbean watching this video, correct me. But that's how I remember the story. Uh, she walks around the village crying at night. You know, like a little child or something, or a woman in pain. And if you go out there, that's it for you. And <laughs> there was a story. I remember a night when I was a real little, I remember we lived out in the countryside and I remember at, at the, the night I mean man when I was growing up there was no like street lights and stuff on the island and it, it wasn't really a village I think it was a house so there was space between the houses but anyway I heard somebody crying out there and boy I was scared I was so scared because you know I heard all these stories right you know when you're kids you believe anything and uh, I remember talking to I don't remember if it was my older brother or somebody telling him I heard my melody and he said no, that's the woman that lived just down the way. She and her husband had a fight so she was home. <laughs> she was walking around crying. I mean, I, I'm laughing, not at her crying, I'm laughing at my childhood mind believing that some uh, extraterrestrial person is out there and if I go outside, I was, I was scared to go outside the next day. <laughs> Let's keep going with this here. Part of the fairy family, Spriggans have little in common with their relatives. They are perhaps the strangest creatures in Celtic mythology. Spriggans are usually male beings with a distorted and ugly body, often made of wood and tree leaves. Although they are almost always small, Spriggans are considered ghosts of giants who, even though they inhabit a more fragile body, retain their enormous ancient strength. In some stories, they can grow enormously when they are angry, briefly regaining the full magnitude of their past as giants. Spriggans live in old castle ruins, where they guard buried treasures and love to do evil against those who offer them. They are blamed for episodes of bad luck, for stolen houses, collapsed buildings, or stolen cattle, for example. As was the case in many ancient cultures, the Celts believed in the existence of sacred and cursed places, which were often inhabited by man-eating creatures. Kelpies are spirit beings, found mainly in Scottish folklore. They live in the lochs and dark moors. Kelpies look like large horses with dark fur and a cadaverous appearance. They can assume a beautiful human form to lure people to the water, where they are suddenly attacked and devoured by the monsters. In some cases, Kelpies take their victims into the water, devour them, and throw their entrails at the water's edge. Despite mentioning a dark and frightening creature, the legend of the Kelpies was a warning to children and young people not to go alone to the lakes where they could have accidents and drown. With the arrival of Christianity in Scotland in the 6th century, folk beliefs were altered and the Kelpies became associated with the figure of Satan. They began to be portrayed as a hybrid between a hoofed animal and a human body, like the god Pan from Greek mythology. Belief in the spirit world also influenced a considerable part of life in Celtic culture. People believed that the souls of the dead... See, the one before, uh, 
Huh. There was a mythical cre I call it a mythical creature. It was called a Kribo. And it was supposed to be this massive snake that uh, if you go into the forest by yourself, boom, boy, it going to get you. You're going to get you. And uh, you know, the older I grow, the more I was like, nobody's ever seen a Kribo. What's going on here? You know what I mean? And uh, the island don't really have any snakes to begin with. And this was supposed to be some like satanic snake type thing that would like, you know, uh, just kill you if you go into the, uh, the, the forest and thing. So now, the older I get and the more I'm like, well, shoot, uh, where is the snake? I, you know, I, don't meet, I haven't met anybody who said they've seen a Kribo. <laughs> and I used to go into that forest by myself all the time when I was older. I was too scared to go in there, you know. Come to find out the island don't really have any poisonous snakes or nothing like that. No alligators, no, 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 no tigers, no nothing like that. There was nothing in there. I guess it was just a story made up by somebody to scare us kids not to go into there. But that didn't stop my mom from talking about the Kribo all the time. <laughs> and it will be judged by the gods, and only the worthy could enter the other world. But if a person were despicable, cruel, and dishonored in life, he could be rejected by the gods and condemned to a life as a wandering spirit known as Slough. Present in Irish and Scottish folklore, the Slough were the souls of evil people who, even after death, maintain confrontational and destructive behavior. Since a single spirit does not represent a great danger, the Slough formed groups that moved like ghostly clouds, usually coming from the West. They would try to enter the houses of people dying to steal their souls, and then add them to their melancholy cloud. For this reason, the windows of a house that were faced west were sometimes kept closed to keep potential victims of the slough away. Another being that exists between the world of the living and the world of the dead is the cruel Abertak, a vampire who rises from his grave to drink human blood. The ancient inhabitants of Ireland were afraid to go near the cemeteries at night, as they were sure that they would be attacked by Abertak. Legend says that the Abertak had been a dangerous dwarf connoisseur of powerful magic and someone who loved to do mischief wherever he went. Tired of seeing his people suffer, a tribal chief, who was also a great warrior, killed the dwarf. He was buried vertically, but the next day he reappeared as a vampire, more powerful than ever. The tribal chief killed him a second time, but the dwarf came back to life again. Finally, a wise druid told the warrior to kill him a third time and bury the body upside down, ending the monster's existence. Something interesting about this legend is that there is actually a place known as the Giant's Grave in Ireland, where the locals believe Abertak is buried to this day. I'm have to go check this out. As the Middle Ages approached, many Celtic legends were adapted and included in medieval tales. The Questing Beast is a monster that appears in the King Arthur legends, with origins in Galician Portuguese folklore, which in turn had many influences from Celtic folklore. The bestial creature was the fruit of a forbidden love between a princess and a demon. Therefore, its very existence was evil and harmful to the world. Similar to the griffins of Greek and Asian mythology, the Questing Beast is a hybrid of several animals, with deer feet, lion's tail, leopard's body, and snake's head, as the fruit of an evil relationship. Ah, hmm. I see the nobility created this creature so their daughters wouldn't marry people that are equally yoked. <laughs> or it could be a religious thing too, you know, don't go marry that guy, that religion there. You know, you won't, you won't either have children that are beasts. <laughs> the question beast could only be killed by a knight of the Holy Grail. His end came in an epic fight against the knight Palamedes, who is part of the medieval legend of Tristan and Isolde. Some of the oldest legends of Celtic culture tell of a great war for dominance in Ireland between the divine people of the Tuatha de Danann and the demonic Fomorians, who were giant monstrous beings from the sea or the center of the earth. The greatest warrior of the Fomorians was the most powerful of his kind, known as Balor, the Evil Eye. Balor was a giant. According to different versions of the story, he could have one, two, or three eyes, one of them poisonous and incendiary. 
With unequal strength and a powerful magical eye, during battles, Balor would launch a jet of fire capable of melting and setting fire to everything in its path. Seemingly invincible, Balor was killed during a great battle where he faced the great god Lug. Lug, with a flaming spear, pierced Balor's eye, putting an end to his reign of terror. Celtic mythology is so vast in its stories that it continues to be studied and unraveled to this day. Much of its influence can be found in current literary and somatic works. Ah, thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did and thing, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I want to do a little bit more on the mythology parts of it. So please, if you have any suggestions for any creatures of mythology in your country, please email me at the address that I'm going to leave in the back, in the bottom. I think it's uh, a giantsworld333 at gmail.com. I'm going to leave that in the, uh, in the link in the bottom. I mean, in the description. Okay, if you guys enjoyed this video and you want to see more videos today, drop a like on this video and take, you know. And uh, hey, if you like what I'm doing, go ahead and subscribe and take, you know, and hit that notification bell so you know when I put up videos, you know. And if you already subscribe, make sure you're hitting the, 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 that notification. Blah, 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 blah. That notification bell is clicked so that you could know when I put out videos. I've been a little bit inconsistent lately because of health issues, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> anyway, man, you all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.